morning. My name is Nicola Tittle, and I'm a seventh grader at Washington Hill School in Seattle. This summer, when I come to the Museum of Flight for Space camp, Training Camp, will mark my seventh year participating in Museum of Flight summer camps. I've been to them enough to know that I like to do either communications or data for the simulated space missions we do every year. The opening of the new Apollo exhibit is very exciting. The recovery of the engines from the rocket that sent humans to the moon is a very impressive achievement, and seeing the engines really shows what humans are capable of when they put their minds to it. Watching those rockets blast off to the moon as a boy inspired our special guest to pursue a career in technology. The memory of them led him to support the search for these engines. Now his company, Blue Origin, is building rockets that will continue the story of human space travel, putting astronauts into space on the new Shepard rocket in the next year or so, and hopefully inspires inspiring others like me to dream about sending humans to the other worlds. And the good news is, they won't have to go looking for those Blue Origin rocket <coughs> engines. They land them back at the launch site. You may recognize our guest as the founder of Amazon and the owner of the Washington Post. He is also a philanthropist who has supported the flight against cancer, neuroscience research, and the construction of a clock designed to last 10,000 years. But I think of him as the person who introduced me to my friend, Alexa, who reads me bedtime stories. <laughs> <laughs> it is my pleasure to introduce Jeff. <coughs> Thank you, guys. Um, I'm going to open up to questions really quickly here. But um, before I do that, there's somebody super important in this audience that I need to introduce. His name is David. David, say hello. Raise your hand. Make sure everybody can see you. David, David is the guy. You saw him on the video briefly. But David is the guy who did all the hard work of putting this expedition together to recover these engines. And let me tell you, anything of this magnitude, actually, any any important uh, achievement um, that you can, do, can think of uh, and, and pursue in life, it's going to turn out to be teamwork. And this was certainly no exception. So being able to build teams and work as part of teams uh, turns out to be an incredible life skill, and one that all of you uh, are already probably learning uh, and will continue to learn uh, throughout your lives. Um, just a couple of things behind me. This is, this is the F1 injector. Um, this was one of the hardest elements of the F1 engine to develop. So back in the 1960s, when they were developing this engine, they didn't know how to uh, uh, stop what's called combustion instability. And that's what these baffles are. So you can see these, this kind of geometric uh, objects sticking out. That's to stop uh, the uh, kind of acoustic energy inside the combustion chamber from reflecting off of the walls and going around and setting up certain resonant patterns. It's a phenomenon a little bit like, um, you know, when you sometimes get a microphone too close to the speaker, you get that high-pitched squeal. That's a very, uh, that's a kind of feedback loop that you don't want. It sets up a resonant frequency. And the same thing can happen inside a combustion chamber. But the energies are so uh, intense that when that happens in a combustion chamber, it just quickly destroys the entire chamber. And in fact, when they developed the F1 engine, they blew up so many engines. And they were just incredibly persistent on the test stand. Over and over and over, they would fail. Um, and, but they persisted. And that's another thing that um, is so important in life, is just that persistence and pushing through failure. That they, uh, they, they succeeded, though. So when, after they uh, blew up all these engines on the test stand, they finally perfected this, uh, this incredible object. And you get to see an unflown F1 engine. There are not very many of these. And the museum here is very fortunate to have gotten one from NASA. This, um, when they finally perfected this, 65 of these engines flew. And there was not a single failure. So that's the result of all of that persistence and hard work from those engineers back in the 1960s. This is a great engine. Um, uh, it, but we're working today, at, I started a company called Blue Origin, and we're working today to make a better engine. Um, it's not going to be as big. It's about a third the size in terms of thrust, a little more than a third. Um, but it has one capability that this engine, one important capability that this engine was never designed to have, and that it is that it's reusable. This engine was designed to be used once and then thrown away into the ocean. And uh, you can never lower the cost of space travel 
uh, if you are taking that approach. Uh, and so that's why we were able to recover these objects, because they were thrown into the ocean uh, more than four decades ago, where they rested on the bottom of the Atlantic under 14,000 feet of water. Um, so this is the, that's the thrust chamber. Um, uh, and you can sort of see, you can kind of match this piece up to that. If you see that kind of waffle pattern there, you see where it goes right there. Um, heat exchanger, turbo pump, uh, the injector. There's, uh, yeah, a lot of interesting parts over here. This is, I guess, part of the turbine. Very cool. So anyway, hopefully you guys will get a chance uh, to go and look at these things a little, up a little closer. And with that, um, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Uh, good. This is one of the great things about kids. There are always questions. I love it. So it's very inspiring. Go ahead, right here in the front. Oh, you have the microphone for you. How old are you? I'm 53. 53. Was it in a trench? Uh, no, we were not in a trench, really. The, the ocean there was pretty flat. But they did dig themselves in. They're heavy objects. And um, when they hit the, uh, the, the ocean floor there is quite soft. It's kind of like mud and silt. And so when they hit the ocean floor, they, they buried themselves. We had to spend a lot of time using dredging equipment to remove all of the uh, mud from around the engine so that we could pull them out. How about right here? Oh, right here. Sorry. You're great. I'll follow you. You got the mic. When you were four, you took apart your crib as a toddler. Have you always been that independent? What's that? Have you always been that independent? I've always been uh, uh, focused. When I was in Montessori school, um, the uh, Montessori school teacher told my mom that I wouldn't switch tasks. And, um, they, and they, they got me to switch tasks by picking me up, including my chair, and just moving me to the new task station. Um, I've gotten a little better about that uh, over the years, but it's still, task switching is still a problem for me. You, where did the mic go? Right here. Go ahead, please. Which crew did that go on? Which, oh, this one never flew. So that's a very good question. The question is, which crew uh, did this engine go on? This engine is unflown. So they made some spare engines that never got used. This is one of those spare engines that never got used. Very good question. Thank you. Where do you see space travel going next? Space travel, um, so my, I want to see millions of people living and working in space. The current global record for astronauts in space simultaneously is 13. And that doesn't happen very often. There have never been more than 13 people in space at the same time. And uh, the problem, of course, is that it's just so expensive. And so we need to figure out how to lower the cost of space travel. And if we can lower the cost of space travel, then there'll be a lot more things that you can do in space. And uh, that, in, the, in, in my opinion, the, 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 the incredible uh, opportunity is reusability. If you can, uh, the an analogy for you would be um, how expensive would um, airplane travel be if you could only use each airplane once? So you fly somewhere and then you have to throw the airplane away. It would be very expensive. Even driving, if you drove somewhere and then had to throw the car away, how expensive would driving be? Um, and so what we really need is, is operational, you know, realistic, practical, pragmatic reusability, just like you see with um, commercial aviation. That's the key. If we could do that, we'll dramatically lower the cost of getting people uh, in, into space. Um, is there still, like, um, parts of rockets down in the ocean, or have you got a to lot. Know of them? No, we left a lot there. There are, so, uh, you know, 65 of these engines flew, and they all landed in a kind of, um, I don't know, in an area, you know, maybe uh, a couple hundred square miles of ocean, sort of 10 by 20 miles, sort of uh, an ellipse out there. They're all pretty close to each other. And um, uh, so, you know, they're there for future expeditions to go and retrieve them uh, or to leave them there. Uh, we wanted to retrieve some of them. We especially wanted to get an Apollo 11 engine, um, uh, and we wanted to do that before 
eventually the ocean um, will corrode those objects and they'll just dissolve into the ocean water. And you can see when you come look at this, uh, the injector and some of these other parts, that process was well underway after four decades uh, at, four, at 14,000 feet. The water pressure at 14,000 feet is 7,000 pounds per square inch. And so salt and other th corrosive things that are in the ocean get into every nook and cranny. And that's why it took so long, by the way, to um, uh, conserve these objects. They had, when we brought them up, we had to keep them, in, keep them wet at all times. Um, and then the, uh, the, uh, uh, some specialists basically carefully disassembled them, cleaned them really well to get rid of all the salt residue and everything else corrosive, and then reassembled them uh, painstakingly. But there's lots down there, and not just F1 engines. There's a lot of space debris. We're still adding to it, uh, you know, because most of the rockets flown today are still, the booster stage is still expendable. And so those things are still going into the ocean quite routinely. Please. Are you planning on removing the space junk orbiting Earth? Oh, what, that, this is a very interesting question. So for, for those of you who don't know this, one of the things that happens as we orbit satellites and other things is sometimes there are accidents um, and, uh, uh, and, and you end up with space debris in orbit. And depending on the orbit, it can last up there for a long time. And if you get too much of it, um, it could be, very, make space travel very difficult because you have to dodge all of that debris. It's moving very fast. And if, you, uh, if your space vehicle gets hit by any of that debris, it's very likely it would puncture it and, um, and cause all kinds of, of problems. And it's bad for satellites and other things. Nobody currently has any good plans. Uh, there are a lot of ideas, but nobody currently has any good plans for removing that space debris. There's lots of People do a lot of activities to keep it from occurring in the first place. So, for example, um, uh, when you have satellites, um, uh, you have to either, uh, there are international rules about satellites, and you either have to deorbit them, you have to preserve enough fuel at the end of the satellite's life to either deorbit the satellite or to boost it into a very high orbit where uh, if you get high enough, the orbits really never decay. Um, they're, you know, the, the reason the orbits decay and these objects fall, uh, you know, and sort of the, if, if it's low enough, they impact little air molecules in space and they will eventually fall into the ocean, which is fine. And if they're high enough, they uh, will just stay up there forever and that's also fine. They won't turn into debris. They won't collide with each other. Please. Did, did all those parts... <coughs> Did all those parts over there get mangled because of the water pressure or something else? They, uh, we believe that, that most of that damage was done on impact with the ocean surface. So um, when, when, these, when the vehicle hit the ocean surface, it was moving very fast. Um, it fell from 40 miles and then hit the ocean uh, surface very hard. And it was not, even though this engine is designed to take extraordinary loads, it generates one and a half million pounds of thrust, all of which is reacted through uh, a little gimbal up at the top. But it's really designed to take all of that load from a very specific direction. And, uh, and of course, when it hit the ocean, it took all of, that, all of those forces from what were effectively random directions. So we think, although you know, we're probably not really sure, that most of this damage being ripped apart was done by impact with the ocean surface. And then, uh, there's also a second kind of damage, which is all the corrosion. When you look at it close, you can see that very easily. Did it? Um, okay. Did it, um, did the um, did the um, spaceship uh, did the uh, did it fall into the water? Yes. Or, and, and sink. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what happened. So the basically the Saturn V is a three-stage vehicle, and the uh, the first two stages fell into oceans. And then the third stage, um, different things happened to it. But some of there's, I think there's a Saturn V third stage that they recently, it kind of came back into Earth vicinity. It's, they're kind of floating around out there. Did you know you wanted to do this when you were a kid? Yes. Well, not this particular expedition, <laughs> but it was a very good question. You know, I, w ever since I was five years old, that's when Neil Armstrong stepped onto the surface of the moon. I've been um, kind of passionate about space, rockets, rocket engines, space travel. 
I became a science fiction reader, um, and I've always known that I wanted to, uh, um, you know, do something having to do with space, and I've spent a lot of time thinking about it for really almost my whole life. And that's one of the things. You guys will find that you have passions, and having a passion is a gift. I think we all have passions, and you don't get to uh, choose them. They pick you, but you have to be alert to them. You have to be looking for them. And when you find your passion, it's a fantastic gift for you because it gives you direction, it gives you purpose. Uh, you can have a job, or you can have a career, or you can have a calling. And the best thing is to have a calling. And if you find your passion, you'll have that, and all your work won't feel like work to you. Did you see any new species? No, we did see um, some marine life on the bottom of the ocean floor down there at 14,000 feet, but not as much as you might think. Down at that depth, there isn't uh, a lot of, uh, there's not a lot of marine life. What do you think, what do you think artificial intelligence has in store for the future of space exploration? Oh, what a good question. Well. Um, one of the things that artificial intelligence has in store for the future of space exploration, I believe, is just ever better robotic probes to explore the solar system. So one of the things that happens, if you look, at, for example, at the um, Martian rovers today, um, they, are, uh, they drive very, very slowly. Um, you have to be extraordinarily careful. The speed of light is actually a limiter on communicate. You can't really operate them remotely very well, because depending on how far away Mars is from Earth at that particular time, it takes many minutes for the light to travel from Earth to Mars. And so that's, that, you know, it's, you can send instructions, but you have to wait a long time to see the results of those instructions. And so that's one of the reasons that, the, um, that the, you get to cover very little ground um, uh, uh, with those rovers. Uh, you don't want to, you know, you spend so much money to get the rover soft landed onto the surface of Mars. The last thing you want to do is like get it stuck in a ditch. Um, and uh, so they're extraordinarily planful. But if you had really good, um, you know, kind of self driving technology, uh, machine vision, and other things, those rovers could keep themselves safe and they could go faster and explore much more in a given amount of time. And that, I think that, that's just one example. I'm, talking, that's, uh, I'm using Mars as an example, but that would be true of all of the robotic probes that we send throughout the solar system. And that's a really good way uh, to do that. I would say another thing is if you want, I think we should build a uh, permanent human settlement on one of the poles of the moon. And uh, it's you know, time to go back to the moon, but this time to stay. And there, you would want to pre-position a whole bunch of equipment and supplies before the humans show up. And some of those things might need to be assembled uh, on the surface of the moon. And that's the kind of thing that could also be done by advanced robotics with uh, you know, machine learning systems on board. Oh, my, question, my question is, what do you see for the future of Blue Origin? Well, so for Blue Origin, we are um, we're working on two vehicles right now. One is called New Shepard. Um, it's a suborbital tourism vehicle. It's named after the first American in space. His name was Alan Shepard. And we're working on a second vehicle, which is called New Glenn. It's named after John Glenn, um, the first American in orbit. And uh, New Glenn is a very large uh, vehicle. Uh, it uses seven of the BE-4 engines for about 3.85 million pounds of thrust. You can think of it as, in terms of thrust, being about half the size of a Saturn V. And uh, that vehicle uh, will fly uh, in 2020 for the first time. We've been working on it for five years already. Uh, we launched um, uh, Pad 36 at Cape Canaveral, so it'll fly from there. Um, and the, the booster stage of that vehicle is reusable. And so and it's designed from the very beginning to be reusable. So that's, and, and the new Shepard vehicle also is designed to be reusable. So again, that's our, our whole uh, approach is to focus on uh, lowering the cost, and that is about reusability, in my opinion. Um, so in your life, what obstacles did you face before you achieved success? Did positivity help you in some ways, and how did you come up with the solution? Wow, that's a good, a good philosophical question. Um, you know, we all have adversity in our lives. You, you, I, 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 would, I, would, I doubt if you really, 
you know, if you know somebody, any friend or anybody that you talk to, um, uh, there's no lack of adversity. And the uh, and by the way, that's good because it's what teaches us how to get back up. You fall down, you get back up. It always happens. And uh, you know, you get certain um, gifts in life, and you want to take advantage of those. Um, uh, but you, I guess, my advice on adversity and uh, success would be to be proud not of your gifts, but of your hard work and your choices. So you know, you may be the kinds of gifts you get in life. You know, you might be really good at math. It might be really easy for you. That's a kind of gift. Um, but practicing that math and taking it to the next step, that could be very challenging and hard um, and take a lot of sweat. That's a choice. You can't really be proud of your gifts because they were given to you. Um, you can be grateful for them and thankful for them. Um, and, but your choices, you choose to work hard. Um, you choose to do hard things. Those are choices that you can be proud of. My question is, what is one thing that you wish the space exploration had? One thing I wish that space exploration had? Is that the question? Is that, I just make sure I heard you right. Um, well, uh, I mean, there are a bunch of ways to answer that question. But for me, what I would lo really like to see, if I could wave a magic wand, I wish that there could be you know, a bunch of very entrepreneurial startup companies doing amazing things in space. Because uh, I think if you had thousands of startup companies, sort of like what we've seen on the internet over the last 20 years. If you look on the internet, there are all these startups. And some of them turn into big companies like Facebook and Snapchat and so on and so on. A lot of them didn't work out. But you got incredible you know, kind of entrepreneurial dynamism. Every experiment got tried. And the reason that could happen is that it doesn't cost very much the price of admission of getting started on the internet. You know, Facebook got started in a dorm room. And uh, uh, to do incredible things in space today, the price of admission, the price of getting started is just way too high. Um, to do anything super interesting in space is an expensive proposition. And we need to lower that price of admission. So, that's what I would really love to see. I would love to see thousands of, of companies. And I think, by the way, this is, this is your generation. You guys and, 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 you, and people your age are the ones who are going to benefit from reusable rockets. You're the ones who are going to come up with those creative entrepreneurial uh, ideas in space. Uh, because the, you know, the, because this, we're working to lower that cost. So we'll be ready for you and your children and your grandchildren. Is there any way that you know of that will reduce the price of rocket fuel to go into space? This is an interesting, this is a very good question. And um, here's the thing that you really need to know is that the rocket fuel is already not a very expensive part of what's happening. So I'll give you New Glenn as an example. New Glenn carries a, a, a few million pounds of rocket propellant, liquid oxygen and liquefied natural gas. The total, and a launch of that scale today um, there are only a couple of vehicles of that size that fly, and um, they are well north of $100 million per launch. And so the cost is more than $100 million to launch that vehicle. And the cost of the propellants is only $600,000. So liquid oxygen only costs 10 cents a pound. Um, and so, you know, a million pounds of liquid oxygen only costs $100,000. And we only have a few million pounds of propellants on board. And liquefied natural gas is not that much more expensive than liquid oxygen. And so the cost of the propellants is really not the problem. The cost, the, the, the real problem is that you have this exquisite aerospace-grade hardware that so many people work so hard to build and perfect and test, and then you use it once and throw it away. How you see how you think tourism will affect the space flight industry? The, a very good question. I I um, I like tourism as a mission for space flight because it uh, the frequency of it can be very high. So you can do a lot of it. And one of the things that we know 
is we humans get better at everything that we practice. And today, the most used launch vehicles only fly maybe a dozen times a year. And you just never get truly great at anything that you do only a dozen times a year. And so if we could fly 50 times a year, 100 times a year, ultimately 1,000 times a year, we'd be getting so much more practice. Um, and tourism is one of those missions that might do that. And there is a long history of tourism and entertainment driving technological advancement. I'll give you a couple of examples. In aviation, early, early days of aviation, one of the only practical applications of early airplanes was barnstorming. And so the, the pilot would fly into a farmer's field somewhere and sell tickets and take people up on joy rides. And um, that's because planes really weren't that capable. And so there wasn't a lot that they could do that was practical, but people liked to fly. And so that, but that lets you start to practice and start to improve and start to get better. Another one much more recent is that some of the advances that we're seeing today in machine learning and in artificial intelligence are being driven by GPUs, which is a special kind of processor, uh, computer processor. And why were GPUs invented? For one purpose and one purpose only. They were invented by NVIDIA for playing video games. And so then people, um, it, they, you know, they were graphics accelerators. And, the, um, and so this invention that was invented by, perfected for, and driven, improvements driven by video games is now at the heart of doing artificial intelligence computations. That's another example. Who has the mic? Underwater, did you see any ships? No, we did not see. We did see a few other things. Um, it, mostly we found only um, rocket engines underwater. We didn't find any ships. But we did see like a Pepsi can. Um, and everything shows up because it's mostly just mud. And, and uh, so you can spot shiny objects pretty easily when you're down with the cameras. So we saw little bits of debris here and there. Uh, but we really didn't see anything like a shipwreck or anything like that. That would have been cool, though. Are you exploring anything new now? Not really. I mean, if you're thinking about this kind of ex like under, underwater exploration, no. I'm putting um, all of my pioneer exploration energy into Blue Origin. So I think it's really important that we build a 21st century version of this engine. And uh, we have the technology today to do it better. As great as this engine was, it wasn't reusable. It actually is kind of a medium performing engine. The, 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 uh, even though the thrust is very high, one and a half million pounds of thrust, the figure of merit for the performance of a rocket engine is something called specific impulse. And this is sort of a medium performing engine. Today, we can build a 21st century version. Of course, we should be able to do better. It's 50 years later. What, what these guys did with the tools and technologies that they had available to them at the time is nothing short of a miracle. What space are you talking about, the space on a computer or the space like the solar system? I'm talking mostly about space like the solar system, although I'm also very interested in cyberspace, which is the space on a computer. I'm interested in both. Um, both are super interesting fields. What motivated or inspired you when times are rough? Say that again, I couldn't hear you. What motivated or inspired you when times are rough? When times are rough. Uh, what motivates me when times are rough? Um, you know, I find if I'm stressed about something, it's usually because I'm not doing anything about it. And so if I'm stressed about something, I'm trying to figure out, why am I stressed? I'm listening to my body as a signal that, I'm, that something is uh, awry. And then I find that the stress goes away the second I take the first step of you know, identify the source of the stress. Why am I stressed about this? What's going on? And then, you know, talk to somebody about it. Find you know, find allies. Um, it, you know, I would say that uh, uh, if you can find um, friends uh, who are interested in similar things or want to help you solve a problem, problem solving is um, is inspiring for me all by itself. I have. As long as I have allies, there's nothing more fun than getting in a room with a group of uh, inventors and saying, look, here's the problem. Let's invent a solution to it. And as soon as you start doing that, I find that it turns from uh, something that might create stress 
into something that creates fun. How did, how did you make all the all these rockets? Well, um, it's again that is a team effort. There are about a thousand people who work at Blue Origin, and um, uh, and growing. And this is not you cannot do this kind of endeavor um, by yourself. It just isn't practical. It's not possible. Um, uh, you know, the in the movie version of this. You know, it's kind of the Tony Stark uh, movie version of this. He, he goes into his basement by himself and builds all of these incredible uh, robotic suits that can fly and, and so on. In real life, you, go, uh, you, you have to work as part of a team to build incredible things. And, um, and, and, and so that's what's going on. The answer to your question is with a lot of help. How did the Sputnik um, orbit Earth? Oh, what a good question. Well, Sputnik is a super famous satellite. Sounds like you know something about it. Um, and Sputnik started the space race back in the 1960s. The, um, the Soviet Union uh, was the first country to launch an artificial uh, satellite around the Earth. It was called Sputnik. It was a very simple satellite, but it was an incredible accomplishment. What's that? It was launched from the Soyuz. That's right. It was launched from the Soyuz. Somebody has been doing their homework. <laughs> Very good. Um, and the, uh, <laughs> I already got the high five for that. It's a, um, uh, and so and it, it was, and it basically threw, um, you know, kind of the U.S. military establishment and the government into a bit of a panic because the question was, well, if the Soviet Union can do this, and they're so far ahead of us in space, what else can they do? Um, and so that kind of led to what ultimately became the Apollo program. In fact, the reason that setting a man on the moon was chosen as the goal was because it was so difficult and so far in the future that it gave us a chance to catch up. And um, that's, what, uh, that's what led to the Apollo 11 uh, lunar mission. What company manufactures Blue Origin's rockets? We do. So Blue Origin manufactures their own rockets. And um, it's a, we've built our own test stands. We have all of our own milling machines. And so we bring in raw materials. And, and uh, raw materials come in one side of the factory, and rocket engines come out the other. Uh, we've built four rocket engines now. The BE-3 is in flight. That's our liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen rocket engine. It's 110,000 pounds of thrust. That's the engine that's on the booster stage of the new Shepard vehicle. It's also going to be on the third stage of the uh, New Glenn, of the three-stage variant of the New Glenn vehicle. Um, when Apollo 13 failed it's like this mission, how did it come back to Earth? Oh, so uh, the Apollo 13, so first of all, the launch was successful on Apollo 13. So they were already on their way to the moon before they had a problem. So they were in their little um, capsule um, and uh, headed to the moon, which it takes about three and a half, three days or so to get to the moon and uh, three days to get back. And once you're on your way, you can't turn around and come back. The only way, you have to finish <laughs> the, the mission. And so you don't have to land on the moon, uh, but you can use the moon's gravity to do a kind of uh, figure eight uh, sw swing by the moon, and then it send you if, you, if you time everything just right, send you back towards Earth. And that's what they did on Apollo 13. So they aborted the lunar landing, and they used the moon's gravity to reverse their direction, and they came back to Earth. But they had to solve a lot of problems um, because they didn't have a lot of battery power. They didn't have a lot of... Uh, I got to talk one time to Jim Lovell, and I asked him if there was anything. He was one of the guys on the, on the, uh, on the Apollo 13 mission. If there was anything that he didn't like about the Apollo 13 movie, because the Apollo 13 movie is a fantastic movie. If you guys haven't watched it, you should definitely watch it. It's very exciting and very, uh, very fun. And, and, uh, and he was an advisor on that movie, and he said to me that, um, the only thing he didn't like, and none, and none of the crew members like this one thing, is that in the movie, they show them arguing with each other because of the stress. 
So they're on this mission. It's a life or death situation. And these professional astronauts are arguing with each other. And he's like, that never happened. <laughs> it would never happen. And he said, I brought it up with Ron Howard, who is the director of the film. And Ron said, Jim, I know. But look, it's a movie. And we have to have stress. And it can't just be like one little drop of sweat on your head. It has to be more obvious. So they, they changed that. Um, and it's not real to life. But it's still very, it's, that movie, in many ways, is very accurate. Do you have any ties with NASA? Yes, I, we do. Blue Origin does have ties with NASA. Um, I also got NASA's permission to recover these engines. Uh, from, they, still, uh, they still belong to NASA, even though they've been on the, the bottom of the ocean floor for more than four decades. They, they're still owned by NASA. Um, they gave me permission to recover the engines. And, uh, uh, but Blue Origin has, does some things with NASA as well. Um, and we also propose things to NASA from time to time. So, for example, uh, we have proposed to NASA this idea of returning to the moon. Um, and, uh, and we would like to set up a cargo service for that. So it's kind of like, you know, uh, we call the program Blue Moon. And we would be, we, we have an architecture and some technologies that allow us to soft land large amounts of mass on the surface of the moon, which would be necessary if you were going to build a permanent human settlement there. My question is, do you, what do you see in the future of oxygenators or bringing oxygen to other planets so that the space missions can last longer? Wow. Um, you know, this, you've hit on something that's really important. If you want to live in space for long periods of time and do so cost effectively, you have to use the resources that you find in space. Um, and so one of the exciting things, you can't just bring everything with you. Um, you know, you can do that if you're going to go for a few days or a few, maybe even a few months. But if you really want to turn it into uh, like a permanent settlement, you want to be able to live off the land a little bit, just like early pioneers did when they came to the New World and other places. And so uh, one of the things that's very exciting about the poles of the moon as a place to go is that just in the last 10 years, we have learned that there is water ice on the moon. This was always thought to be impossible because water, whenever the, uh, the sun, when sunlight hits, if sunlight were to hit ice on the moon, it would heat up, it would turn to uh, a vapor uh, because of the vacuum. And then, um, because the moon's gravity is so low, it would actually escape over time from the surface of the moon. It would just kind of evaporate out into space. And so the moon is a very dry place in general. But what we now know is that in certain craters on the poles of the moon, the North Pole and the South Pole of the moon, they are in permanent shadow. The sun never uh, reaches to the bottoms of those craters. And as a result, we now know that there, is, there are a bunch of volatiles like, like ice water um, frozen in those permanently shadowed regions. And so once you have water, you can make oxygen. So you can use electrolysis to split water up into hydrogen and oxygen. And the oxygen obviously is super useful. So you can use it, and so is the hydrogen. You can use them as rocket propellants if you want. You can breathe the oxygen. Um, so uh, that, that's a very important discovery that we've learned about the moon in just the last decade. This is a thank you from oh. all of the kids. Oh my goodness, thank you. <laughs> Here, let me set this down. Thank you guys. This is very cool, and I had a lot of fun doing this. Your questions are fantastic. Thank you. And you can, the, what I'll leave you with just one quick thing which is that for a long time, many, I mean, hundreds of years, thousands of years, the idea of going to the moon was so impossible that people actually used it as a metaphor for impossibility. And then, in the 1960s, we humans did it. And what I would hope you would take away from that is that anything you set your mind to, you can do. Von Braun said after the lunar landing, I have learned to use 
the word impossible with great caution. And I hope you guys take that attitude about your lives. Thank you.